In our society, as a consensus, there is a certain order of things. It's passed through generations as if it's agreed upon globally. It goes like this. Humankind is on top, top of the food chain. If you ask a typical human, top of every chain. After humankind comes animals. And after that, there are objects. Human, animal, object. This hierarchy seems to be set in stone, at least when presented with a clear moral question. There is the famous burning building. A human, a dog and a phone are about to die. Which one do you save? Human, right? Well, congratulations, you just saved Hitler. That raises a new moral question. What if there are two humans in that eternally burning building? then you can't get away with keeping them anonymous and lacking character. In order to save the right one, we need to know who's with us and who's with them. You see, us are more important than them. That's the quick summary of the dehumanization process. You can stop watching now, I guess. Or stick around, there's a little more to it. The more is at stake, the gap between us and them grows wider and wider. For instance, what if there is no burning building? What if you have two people in front of you and you have to decide which one you're going to shoot? But now I'm talking about wars and nations, when actually dehumanization is something all of us are doing all the time. While shopping, if getting a traffic ticket, in online interactions with some humans and some bots. That last one is especially confusing. How do you know the difference? In fact, I was a subject to a subtle dehumanization a few months back, when my arguments were dismissed by claiming that I'm just an animated cow. And those who claimed this should count their lucky stars that I'm not trolling the clips. So what might we mean when we say this word? There are three situations that can be described as dehumanization. Mechanization, a literal removal of humans from a process and being replaced by mechanical processes. Brutalization, an altering of one's mind through brainwashing or mind programming. Or animalization or objectification, which corresponds with the hierarchy which we are definitely on top of. It's the third one that is really interesting psychologically and is relevant to our discussion here. And let's face it, this is the way most of us use the word anyways. This is the process that allows us to dismiss each other, among other things. This is why I'm more of an asshole on Twitter than I am in real life. This process functions in an interesting way, quote, this is a fundamentally metaphorical word with a psychological act that often has tangible consequences. I love this explanation so much because it helps us avoid playing stupid word games. This type of dehumanization is not literal, it's not a physical act. It's a thought process of one group about another group. Dehumanization is considered to be this rare thing only Hitler's and Stalin's do, but it's actually mundane and common. One theory of this everyday low-key dehumanization is called infrahumanization, which was coined by Jacques-Philippe Leyens et al. This theory states that one of the reasons we do this to each other is when there is a need to praise the group we are in, the in-group paired with the need to devalue the outgroup. And we aren't even aware that we are doing it. But once I read this, I started seeing it everywhere. It's also posited that when we dehumanize the outgroup, we reduce, again, in our minds, 
the possibility that the others can experience secondary emotions. These are considered to be more complex and therefore exclusively human emotions. And these are the emotions that follow the primary basic ones. In this article on the subject they give the example. If the primary emotion is anger and the secondary emotion is guilt, then the primary anger is turned inward. If you grow up in a different country, neighborhood, house, a different secondary emotion would turn the anger elsewhere. All this to say that when we dehumanize members of the outgroup, we dismiss the possibility that they can have the same complex emotional reactions as we do. Therefore, they are less human than us. So dehumanization is a process that goes on in our minds where we stop thinking that they function similar to us. But why? Well, one of the reasons is that we have a perception that we, humans, are moral creatures. And whoever undermines this perception might trigger this process in our minds. Quote, we stop perceiving others as having the same feelings, thoughts and processes as we have, and thus stripping others of human qualities we might share. I've been thinking about this for a while. I think that dehumanization is basically the thought process of coping with a category error. The category error is humankind is categorized as moral. And when a humankind doesn't meet this criterion, well, they are not human then, are they? <laughs> the cope is, if they are non-human, they don't think or feel emotions like us. Therefore, they can be easily dismissed. We basically just make shit up about them and act as if it's true. Sounds like prime copium to me, the Twitter troll variety. And if I'm not wrong, and a category error is the root of the matter, then guess what? In the same way that dehumanization has several definitions, so does the word deanimalization. Forgive me for the poor source, the word is rarely used. I think in one instance it's the removal of animalness. I'm doing this right now, I'm deanimalizing myself. Butchering is another form of this, where the dead animal is separated and grinded into products, no longer resembling the creature it once was. In another instance it's a physical removal of animals from a space where animals hang out, I guess. This paper does something interesting with the word. The term deanimalization is used to point out how farming practices are putting animals in environments that don't allow them to express their animalistic traits. This is closer to what I'm talking about, but not quite there yet. And I'm probably not the first one to think of this word in this way. I'm thinking of using it similarly to the definition of dehumanization that we previously explored as a fundamentally metaphorical word for a psychological act that often has tangible consequences. The animalization that I'm proposing here is a thought process that happens because we have a motivation for some animals to be lesser or not animal-like. In other words, this is us making stuff up about them. Because we need to praise humankind and devalue certain animals. Imagine the next conversation. Some of you don't have to imagine it. Uh, you had this exact conversation many times. Imagine asking a dog lover if they would eat dog meat. In most cases, the answer would be no. And what is the difference between a dog and a cow that makes it okay to eat beef but not dog? We've been raising dogs to be companions and cows to be food, is often the answer. Some would go as far as to say that dogs can experience human-like emotions and cows cannot. But those are imposed categories and they tell us nothing about whether or not cows have the same traits as dogs do. The building is not burning. 
We don't have to save one and let the other die. So what's going on? Well, to me it seems that societally most animal lovers attribute animalness to dogs and a handful of other animals, but downgrade cows from animal status to object status at worst, categorizing them only by the product they end up being, or at least a lesser animal, a sub animal. I must admit though, it could be just that we should keep dogs and cows in different categories, and that the animal category is too wide to house all species in it. But I'm pretty convinced that these two animals belong in either the same category or two separate but equal categories. And I could at this point talk for hours about the stream of papers where cows are easily trained, shown to be intelligent, shown to have wants, needs, emotions. None of these papers were written by militant vegans. Almost all of them are from animal agriculture academia. And some of these make me wonder if we should grant both cows and dogs and other farmed animals actual humanness. But at the least, cows should have the status of dogs, based on their actual traits, if we are willing to put aside our copium for a second. But it gets a little worse. The animalization status of farmed animals is our fault in more ways than one. Firstly, when we talk about secondary emotions, we should acknowledge that people raised in different countries will have different responses to their basic emotions. Same goes for people raised in the same country, but different households and so on. So which secondary emotions we feel are going to be dependent on socialization. But what would happen to humans who were raised by no one? Like in the case of Romanian orphans who were isolated almost without a caregiver or socialization with adults. They never developed properly emotionally and physically. Maybe farmed animals being perceived to not have secondary emotions is the product of them being isolated from an early age, deprived of social circles, having only other animal toddlers to keep them company. Maybe that's the actual difference between a dog who is considered to be part of the family and a chicken who was caged right after birth. Maybe. And maybe it's all in our heads. Most of the literature on comparison of human and animal emotions is on humans attributing emotions to animals. This is us judging their ability to feel. We are the arbiters of the separation between these categories. It's not real. It's a category error. It's just a cope. 